Great, so I think we're gonna get started. So thank you so much for coming to attend this webinar on chatbots and conversational um, user design. Um, it's gonna be a great conversation with a very experienced woman, Stacey Saronic, who I'll tell you about in just a bit. So, who am I? So my name is Samantha Carlin, and I'm the head of global community and expert engagement at Common Genius. So what is Common Genius? Common Genius is a new platform where you can access experts on demand. So whether you're trying to build your business or you have a question about your product or you're even looking for a career mentor, you can book private one-on-one -on -one sessions through video chat with experts from all over the country and sometimes the world. Uh, we have a range of experts in all sorts of fields and some pretty incredible, powerful people that it would be difficult to gain access to without having a platform like this. <laughs> So our platform is launching in January, but our app is available for iOS download now, and I'll show you the link to the app uh, towards the end of the webinar. So let me tell you a little bit about our speaker that you're seeing here today. So Stacy is the head of UX at Catalia Health, and prior to working at Catalia Health, she designed, managed, and strategized for over 20 years, ranging from gigantic corporations such as Wells Fargo, to national, multinational advertising agencies, ed tech, nonprofits. She's also founded and managed a couple of her own businesses. My personal favorite is uh, the, a couture fashion line and also an independent record label. Uh, her experience is very broad and ranges from all sorts of areas. And I think that that kind of unique background is what enables Stacey to be just so good at user experience. Um, she, her most recent work and research has specifically focused on how to create dynamic conversational experiences within products, especially through the use of AI, chatbots, and robots. So this is someone who's actually been researching this and thinking about this a lot. Uh, so we're really excited to have her here. She also has a BA in liberal arts from Bennington College and a master's in human computer interaction uh, and, and design. So without further ado, Stacy, I'm going to hand it over to you. Cheers. Thank you so much introduction as well. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time zone you may be in right now. Um, today we're going to talk a little bit about or you, first of all. Uh, and if it is, where do I begin? So I know this is sort of where everybody's, I'm guessing, is itching to start with. Is like, oh, let's dive right in. Where do I begin? OK, just take a deep breath. We, we will get there. Um, so this, there's, there's essentially a seven-step process, like really. It, it kind of is that I, I'm, I'm very much simplifying seven steps um, but because each of these takes time, quite a bit of it for some of them. Um, but it, it really is this process. And I'm going to really unpack numbers two and five quite a bit today. Um, so quickly, though, where, where do I start? you start with picking a very specific use case or customer journey to solve for. And when I say very specific, I mean really, really, really specific, like a, almost like a singular question. Um, and, and if you're not familiar with um, really sort of what, what is meant by conversational interfaces, very quickly, I'm assuming everybody here has a, a general sense of this, but just in case, um, or CUI uh, for short, what I'm talking about are chatbots or robots, anything where a person is uh, not necessarily using a, you know, texting in some way, uh, where they're actually talking, conversing, base. And, and sometimes these are multimodal interfaces where you can talk to a device or an app or, um, or, or within an experience, but you can also use a screen. Um, and we're going to touch on that a little bit too. But when it comes to these sort of conversational experiences, specifically chatbots, robots, um, and, and very specifically socially, uh, social robots, things that look kind of humanoid and are designed to interact with humans, not uh, you know, the sort of robots that build cars. Um, so pick a very, very specific, um, and, and again, I mean kind of almost like us and be able to answer that question really, really well, if that's if that's what you're going for. I'll, I'll get into a little bit more of that in a minute. Number two, understand people's real world situations and experiences around that journey. We're going to talk quite a bit about that. Um, number three, take an initial assessment to determine 
what is the best possible experience given your business, your market, uh, and human in general, human needs. Um, and, and pause at this point because you may get to this point and realize, especially after going through number three, uh, that a chatbot, not the best solution to the problem that you have or that your customers or your uh, users, though I hate to use that word, uh, the folk are servicing. Um, if, if what they need because of their problem is not a chatbot, uh, don't build one, honestly. Uh, don't build a robot. Don't build, I mean, that's a, that's a huge, huge endeavor, especially hardware and software, um, if it's not really the right solution. If it is, after you pause uh, and you determine that a conversational user interface is truly best, at this point you're going to take initial assessment of the research uh, for the best type of conversational UI to build and for the prototype. Um, and by best type, I mean, uh, is, it, is it really a chatbot, something that you're texting with or or is it a, something that something like an Alexa where it doesn't look like a robot, but it definitely is and you're just talking to it? Um, is it a multimodal interface where uh, maybe it's an Alexa with a screen or it's a robot that has a face and a tablet? Um, and then at that point, if, if you're talking about, uh, and we'll get into what I, specifics and the differences here, but generally determine what outside data is needed to answer the questions uh, that your conversational experience needs to be able to answer. What, and, and this is really, really, again, where the questions and the answers start becoming really important. Um, because where that data and how you're going to get it, uh, this may help inform the technology that you use. And then you start creating your prototypes, your rough prototypes and scripts, and test and iterate and test and iterate and test and iterate. Um, so that, that's really the seven steps. Where do I begin? Uh, so let's dig in a bit. Um, as I said, we're going to talk quite a bit about numbers two and five, um, and there will be time to have things. So when you just take an assessment, what do I mean by take an assessment of your existing data and research, determine what kind of experience is best? I am really serious when I say this, forget technology. I know this is a, a webinar about chatbots uh, and conversational UI, and it's very shiny and sexy and exciting right now. Um, no doubt, I, I agree. Uh, but really, if you're if you're looking to build something for a group of people, uh, forget technology and consider what kind of experience is going to best serve those needs uh, and solve that problem. And and try to pick out themes from the research that you do, um, and because this is going to help. In really, have no idea uh, whether what kind of solution to build. Th those themes that you, you find in your research uh, are going to help, help inform what, what kind of, what is the best solution and, and then can you do it? Um, is it worth it? If your pro project is already later into the discovery or any time in the design phase, uh, be aware of, just be aware of confirmation bias. Um, let the research tell you what it will and don't try to fit it into expect to hear. Um, I, I also can't stress this one enough. If you're coming to this webinar um, at a point where you're already knee deep in building a chatbot for, especially for a large enterprise, um, and you're starting to wonder whether maybe this is the best solution uh, for the problem that you're trying to solve, I, I applaud you for, for taking the steps to, to question this, especially if, if the research you're seeing and the testing you're seeing or, or your um, teams that are doing this work are seeing is, is maybe raising some questions as to whether this is even the best solution. Um, just be aware of confirmation bias. It, it happens to us all. Uh, it's really hard to avoid. That All I can tell you is to be aware of it and that will help you avoid it. Um, so try to hear what is really being observed, what is really happening, instead of what you really, really want to hear and see, which is that what you built is fantastic. It might be, not be, though. Um, so how do I know if a conversational UI is the best solution? First of all, do not ask the people that you're designing for directly whether they'd use a chatbot or robot or what they'd use one for. Um, this sounds, if you're coming to this webinar and you're a UX professional or researcher, 
onto yourself and say, of course not. Um, if you're not, uh, don't feel bad because lots of people do this. Um, it, it seems like a good idea, and I get that. Um, it's really not uh, to go, just go out there and start asking people, what, what would you like a robot for? What would you like a chatbot for? If I were to build a chatbot that does X, use it. Um, these are not fair questions to ask people. Uh, imagine scenarios that don't exist and, and situations are so far from what currently exists. You're, you don't really know exactly what that person is imagining when you tell them to imagine this situation. It could be very, very different uh, than your intention or what you're imagining. Um, and suddenly you're going to get answers and suggestions of, oh, I want this, and I'd use this, uh, and they would, and maybe they would um, It's rude to ask people that kind of question and it, to ask them to imagine things, and you're going to get uh, bad information when you ask folks directly, uh, what would you use a, non a currently non-existent product or service to do? Uh, it, it, it's just a bad idea. So when you get out there, what you really want to do um, is observe people a lot. And we're going we're gonna to look at this in a, in a few minutes. Um, but pick out themes in your customer and market research. And you're looking for one of two things. These are sort of the keys, um, especially if you're talking about, if you're talking about chatbots. These two things are, are really the key questions to, to things to look for. Are you seeing repeatedly asked questions with fairly straightforward answers? An example of this might be if you have, a, if you own a piece of software, um, are people or um, or, or are people frequently calling in or emailing or or, or getting support in some way, asking for a password reset? Uh, things that are repeatedly asked over and over and over, and there really is a pretty straightforward answer. Yes. Do this, do this, and do this. Um, you know, whatever that answer, straightforward answer is. Um, the other thing to look for that uh, you know allude to a chatbot might be a good solution uh, is a need or desire to drive behavior change. Um, and and this one really might lead you more to a socially assisted robot over a chatbot. Um, there's lots of research that's been done um, about behavior change and the ethics around it, how to do it, when to do it, uh, why not to do it, how to go about doing it. Um, and really, that, that can be its own conversation, quite honestly. And I, I'm not here to, 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 to debate the ethics of behavior. Um, in my world, I work in, in healthcare right now. Uh, this is something that, that is part of my work. Um, and which is why I work with a socially assisted solution uh, that, that our company has come up with. So repeatedly asked questions with fairly straightforward answers might bring you to a good solution might be a chatbot. A need or desire to drive behavior change, uh, you might really be assisted robot. All right, um, before we move on and talk a little bit more about observing people, look at your, are there any questions um, that we can talk that we can look at right now? Let's see. So Mo has a question: Who should be designing the CUIs, UI, UX, conversation strategists, linguists, business analysts, or um, and many others? Uh, so then, that's not a. What I'm seeing is that people. It, Conversation design is a multi, is a multi, is a team sport. Let's just to start there, um, and it's going to take a lot of different types of people and different types of experts working together. Um, truly, if you're going to build uh, the the best solution, uh, the, the the right way, if you are not in a, in a in a situation where you can hire a team of experts, um, or you don't, know, the one person you find that might be the best is really a writer, um, to actually write the dialogue. Doing the rest of it, uh, it depends on what, what path you take. Almost anybody can do, or you need a really specific technical engineer. 
Um, but the person who should be writing the dialogue might be a UX writer or a designer. They might be a conversation strategist or linguist, uh, maybe a business analyst. I haven't seen that yet. What I have seen, very successful conversation writers, um, are, made, are folks who write screenplays, uh, dialogue writers for, for scripts, um, and, and for uh, folks who are um, nonfiction writers, even people who uh, a lot of different types of creative folks I found people who are animators you you wouldn't even know uh, that they could write um, but because they're used to telling a story visually uh, they have they have picked up on this sort of in a, in a level how to how to communicate um, so those it, all my point is is that folks who might be best at this you might find in the strangest places. Um, so, uh, oh, Mo says, I'm a business analyst at UPS. I was just proposed to us. I don't, I don't, uh, I don't, um, yeah, I, that's really interesting. I've worked with business analysts doing this work as well, um, and it just depends. Um, I, it, it's not that we necessarily, these are just the business analysts I've worked with, Mo. So trust me, you might be a great writer. A conversation I've worked with, um, we're great at figuring out what we needed to talk about. Not so much the how do we talk about it, uh, but you, you might be great at that too. Um, so observing people, you want to look for patterns of behavior. So this is really at the crux um, of, of, of doing this kind of work. I, I would say you want to really, so if, if you're looking to make a career out of this kind of work, um, this is where you, you really want to dive in deep and understand how to do all of the things on, that you see on the slide right now. Um, otherwise, you can hire a person to do this kind of work for you, um, or plenty of good books out there um, and uh, resources that can help you to learn how to do some of this. It really is a lot about directly observing the folks that you're trying to build a solution for in situ. Um, don't bring them, at some point you're gonna have prototypes and it's not gonna be really uh, appropriate or possible necessarily to go out there and, and uh, bring your prototype to people, although, um, if you are building a physical thing, like a robot, um, it's going to be a robot that they use in a store. You will need to do, do testing in the store. If it's a robot they're going to have in their home, you'll need to do testing in the home. Um, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. Uh, right up front, lots of direct observations of watching people in their go about their daily lives, watching them try, struggle with the problem that you're try you've been tasked with solving. Ethnographic studies, if you're able to do long-term um, longitudinal studies with some of these folks um, and watch them over time, that can really, really, uh, that can be a great form of doing the generative research that uh, can really answer the question of if you are going about this with, I want to build a robot or I want to build a chatbot, now what, what, what do I do with it? Um, doing an ethnographic study is certainly going to help you figure out where you might apply technology that you've already uh, built. And if that's who you are, if you're, you're a technology company or you've developed an algorithm and you're looking, well, what do I do with it? Um, I would strongly encourage you to just get out there and watch people um, and be aware of confirmation bias as you do so. Um, diary studies is another excellent way of researching with folks to get a sense of in the moment, how do they feel about certain experiences? Um, it's much better to do that kind of, to ask those kind of questions. How do you feel about when such and such happened, when it's happening? Um, and that's that's how you get that information is with a diary study. If you work for a company that's large enough um, or you're lucky enough to have things like instant messaging logs, uh, I, if you're working, if you know, if you're looking for an app to build an enterprise messaging logs between employees, if it's more for customer support than if you have a support channel, those logs, 
Do you have IVR logs if you have a phone system, a phone support system? These are great uh, starting points to start looking at what are people asking about? Um, and it can even be a great way to look at how are they asking about it. Um, there's one thing I would mention just from personal experience that I can tell you. If you do uh, have the luxury or the bane of your existence, depending on things, uh, working for a really, really large enterprise that has lots of IVR logs that you can comb through, that can be a brilliant place to start. Um, for, for figuring out uh, for a chatbot especially, uh, that if you're gonna automate that process, as uh, I did on a team that I worked with, or we tried to, um, that the first thing people say when they call into a customer support line, uh, you should, that first sentence, if you can break things apart that way in your automated analysis, uh, just ignore. Because most of the time that first utterance is uh, some sort of, hello, my name is such and such, I'm having a problem, I don't know what to do about it. I'm having a really frustrating time. Yeah, I've been waiting a really long time. Can, you know, that, that first utterance generally has nothing to do with the problem, is what I'm trying to say. Um, Open-ended individual interviews, always a fantastic place uh, to get lots of good information. Co-creation workshops, if you could bring your folks, bring folks in who you're trying to build things for and design with them, bring them along on this process, that always uh, brings, uh, brings you faster to the be a best solution, really. And eavesdropping is maybe the easiest one to do um, and the, the most important. Um, if you are not, if you're doing this kind of work and you're not currently eavesdropping all the time as much as you possibly can, I strongly encourage you to start doing so. Um, you, you will learn to do this in such a way that people don't give you dirty looks eventually. I promise. Um, or so I've read. <laughs> um, no, seriously, though, but eavesdropping is a really, really good way to, to hear how people actually talk to each other um, so that you can avoid stilted language and stilted conversations when you do get into this kind of work. Uh, patterns of behavior which lend themselves to CUIs because now we're starting to get to some of the good stuff. Um, so if you're looking to build a chatbot, there are certain patterns of behavior that you want to look for uh, when you are doing all research. Uh, if customers are repeatedly asking customer support team members the same questions like, that have straightforward answers like, how do I reset my password? How do I buy a, a software key? Or, or what is my software key? Uh, things like that. How do I reset? What's your phone number? How do I reach you? The other thing to look for are jobs to be done. Uh, if you're not familiar with the JTB framework, um, definitely something to look into. Jobs to be done, jobs that are simple, whose underlying motivators aren't important, relatively speaking. So an example of this would be setting a cooking timer. There's, there's no high stakes involved except maybe you burn your dinner. But we're not talking about literal life and death here. We're not finances or health. Um, we're talking about simple tasks in which the reason they're doing them really doesn't matter to the experience. Um, if you're looking to build a robot, these kind of patterns might lend the robot. If you see that, that people are looking to um, hire a, something uh, to do a job which requires behavioral change. This might not be something that you observe on the part directly of the folks you're looking to design and, and, and build for. Um, this is something that you'll, you, you'll, you may really need to tease out of the patterns of what you do observe and how you might help. Um, also jobs which are enhanced by a personified human or human-like relationship. Um, an example of this would be like a, a uh, home health robot. Um, an assistant of some kind that lives um, in which you need to build uh, a, a relationship with and need to trust, um, having that face is really sort of what it's all about in that experience. Um, and in that case, if you do find that you really need to build a trusting relationship with your customer um, or with whoever you're designing for, um, you might consider building a robot with a face. Um, okay, 
So you're going to look at all of your research, and you're going to take an initial stab at building your prototype. So how do you do this? Did you first digitize all your notes? If you haven't already, uh, digitize them all and put individual observations and quotes into a gigantic spreadsheet um, and start to categorize them by type. So specifically, uh, th this is going to help you very specifically for, with a chatbot. Um, and it might help a little bit if you're thinking of building more of a robot. Um, but if you categorize them into these three ways as informational, transactional, and agentive. And what I mean by that, an informational um, thing that you observe might, might be somebody looking to know what is or how do I. Um, a transactional one might be, I want to do something. I want to do X. Um, and, and an agentive question would be, please help me to do something. Act on my behalf to get something done for me. You're going to create a column in your spreadsheet labeled basically. And in that cell for each data point for which this makes sense, take a stab at what the intent is behind that note. So basic, you know, the fastest route to the closest bathroom. Create, you know, observe if you're working on a chatbot uh, that was a bathroom finding chatbot um, and something that you observed might lead you statement. Basically, somebody wants to know the fastest route to the closest bathroom. And for chatbots, again, create a column labeled related possible entities. And for each row that has a value for the basically column, note what entities might be needed. So in that basically statement example, some entities that might be needed are location, uh, room, restroom, and location current. Um, now I'm gonna, there's a handout that everybody will be able to get a copy of that is a blank version of this spreadsheet. And it, I think that this will make much more sense when you look at that spreadsheet and start to get into this work and really see what I'm talking about. Right now, this might seem very abstract and somewhat confusing, to be frank, which is why we're going to move on uh, for now. So before we do, though, and, and we really get into, let's do it. Um, so four tips for multimodal design. Now, what I mean by multimodal design, and this is quite likely what you very well may end up creating. If, if you are leaning towards the direction of creating a conversational user interface because your research and observations lead you in that direction, um, there's a good chance it's going to be multimodal. And that means there's going to be mul multiple means of interacting uh, with that thing or experience. Might, people might be able to speak to it, they might be able to text or type to it, um, or there might be a screen of things that they can watch but can't actually interact with. Uh, lots of, there might be things that they can hear um, and, and, but can, and can see but can only interact with text. I said lots of different ways to define multimodal design. Um, but there's a huge difference. There's four things to keep in mind when you're designing for these experience that, experiences that are uh, you know, non-traditional, that aren't a website or an app. There's a huge difference between creating for viewing and creating for listening. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to unpack these, don't worry. When creating content intended to be read, all the good stuff goes first. But when creating content that will be heard and interacted with vocally, all the good stuff needs to go at the end. Uh, don't use additional modes of input just because they're available to you. Ensure they actually enhance the experience you're creating. And you can use, you can Wizard of Oz style test content and voice uh, and tone and pacing to a degree, but these may be bound by technical limitations. So I'm going to unpack each of these. Um, and very quickly, if you're not familiar with the term Wizard of Oz style testing, um, it, it is what it sounds like. Um, it's when you have a prototype that might be very, very lo-fi, uh, low-tech, and there is a person who is pretending to be the experience or the interface or the object. Um, and they might be literally behind a curtain or in another room, depending on what, what that experience is you're trying to test. That's what Wizard of Oz style testing means. So creating for reading versus listening. Um, there's three examples that you're going to see on the screen right now um, that are showing the same phrase the way that you might type it 
And if you were to type the phonetic version of how somebody is particularly in New York uh, might say these things. So what do you want? If you think about that, listen to somebody ask you that question next time. Uh, unless you're in New York City, it may not sound quite like, what do you want? But it sounds a lot more like, what do you want? What do you want? Then what do you want? The next one, what was that? That's something that you would read. Like is that, not gonna speak that. What was that? What was that? If you write that out phonetically, it does not translate back to what was that. Um, this is my favorite one. Um, if, and I, I like looking at the speaking version first because it, unless you're a New Yorker, it's really not obvious. Did you eat yet? No. Did you? Jeet No. Ju? Um, the reason I'm bringing this up is that when you start getting into uh, tweaking your conversational experiences and how they sound, there is software out there that can help you make things sound more like a human. Um, and if you don't want to go that route, uh, having cre or, or rolling your own, so to speak, creating your own experience from scratch, this is just something to keep in mind, that you would not want a robot to speak what do you want? You'd want the robot to sound a little bit closer to what do you want? Um, here's another example of what I'm, the, the importance of and what I'm talking about, the difference in creating content that's meant for reading versus meant for listening. So on the left, um, as you'll see, and you can't see that well uh, because I had to make lots of screenshots, but that's actually one web page that scrolls all the way down um, and it's to answer the question, how do I change a light bulb? Um, this, is a, a, this is a good example, uh, one might think, of a simple question with a straightforward answer. Not so much, necessarily. Now, this is something that you could, in a, in a conversational experience, and I'm showing you ex an example here of how you might play, out, play that, how that conversation might play out. Um, but the point is, is that there's a whole lot of content there, a whole lot of words on the screen on the left side um, that really, you, you, by the time you get to the bottom of the screen, you have your answer, um, whereas you can get to that answer a lot faster um, with a conversational experience if you questions in the right way. Um, so how this might play out is instead of creating all of the step one, step two, step three, step four, which is how this content was formatted for reading. Um, there's a couple of things if you did read those steps. It'll say, um, if you're in this situation, do this, otherwise move on to step three. Now, if you were to do that in a conversational experience, it would not only be tedious, uh, difficult to follow, and it, by the end you would have, what, what am I supposed to do to begin with? So one way you might do this is um, the, we're going to assume that a person said something to their conversational device um, to the effect of, how do I change a light bulb? And so the object says, I understand you want to know how to change a light bulb. Is that right? This is confirmation. Make your, your object or your bot understands what has been said, giving the person a chance to say, no, not even close to what I said. Let's assume the person said, yep, that's exactly it. Okay, and what kind of light fixture is this bulb in? You might say things like table lamp or ceiling fan or track lighting for examples. And here is an example of disambiguation where you're giving the, the person that is having this experience examples of, A, examples of what this experience can accept as far as content, what kind of, ex of content it can accept, um, but also, letting the person know um, there, there are choices to be made here and I, I need you to tell me what the answer is to this so that I can give you the right answer. Um, so we're gonna, we, in this example, we assume that the person says ceiling fan. So the answer then we get to is okay, first turn off the power of the ceiling fixture and then get a sturdy ladder if you can't reach the ceiling. Don't use a chair. So this is, this is a context sensitive, an example of a context sensitive answer. We've had to ask the person a few questions off of their, from their initial question in order to give them the right answer. 
We're going to move on to front loading versus end loading the good stuff. Yes. That's the question. So, um, and again, we're, I'm going to forge forward here. So we still have quite a bit to get through. Um, so here on the screen is an, a, an example I'm showing you of what I mean by putting all the good stuff at the end. So this is the same content. This is the same information that you're seeing. Just take a moment, read to yourself the for reading part. Close your eyes if you need to so that you don't read along with me on the, as you listen to what I say. I curiosity and her formal education and life experiences. For over 20 years, Stacey Saronic has been a professional service designer and experienced researcher. What do you remember about that? You remember that I've been a professional service designer and experienced researcher for uh, some number of years. Hopefully that you remember more than 20, but maybe not. And whereas if we had used the for reading a blurb as um, Stacy Saronic, let's just listen to this so you hear. Stacy Saronic is a service designer, experienced researcher with over 20 years of experience across a broad range of industries. Her combined experiences in education and curiosity continue to drive her both professionally and personally. You're left with the impression of she's driven, she's a curious individual, not that she's been working in this field for more than 20 years. Um, Gabrielle, I hope that answered your question. Um, so here's an example of ensuring that multi-modes enhance and not detract or distract. So just because you can doesn't mean you should. Is my So in the example I'm showing here, and this is um, a real example that hasn't necessarily gone into production. This is from some research work a while back for a uh, company I was consulting with at the time. Um, and we're talking about a home healthcare robot who speaks with you and you speak back. Um, she holds a little tablet. So there is the option to have visuals on the screen beyond the words that she's speaking. Um, and without getting into a whole bunch that's not important to this uh, webinar, she in that robot's experience, most of what that tablet was there for was to create an accessible experience for people who are deaf so that they could be able to read um, and interact in that way with the robot. So um, there is a tablet. There is a visual component. So just because you can doesn't mean you should. And this, this is an example you're looking at right now where you, it might be a good idea to use that secondary mode of input. Um, where in this example, a patient has said to the robot, of, of you know, the, we're having a conversation and we're onboarding new medications. The patient is telling the robot, these are the medications that I take. And in this example, the patient has told the robot a medication sheet that the robot isn't familiar with. So she might say, I'm sorry, I'm not sure I heard you correctly. Here's a couple of options I think it might be. Can you tell me or tap on the right one? And then show the pictures of two pills that sound very much the same. These are made up, if they actually exist, it's completely by accident, Alessa and Alexel. That's an example of when you, you have the multi-mode, you have a secondary mode of input available to you. Reason, a good, good time where you might use it. It's helpful to the experience. It's helpful to the patient. Here's an example, which thank goodness, air production, um, when you wouldn't want to do this just because you can. So at, continuing in that same example, the patient is given this medication that they want to take um, and meet the robot says, okay, great, got it. Now, how much do you take and when? Drag pills into the right hour bottle to show me how many you take at that time. So um, tap and drag from that pile of that visual pile of pills as however many you might take at the right time. And is it AM, is it PM? bad time to use a secondary mode of input. Not necessary, not helpful. Okay, Wizard of Oz testing is great, but um, at what stage are you? So if you're, if I'm, the framework I'm using to talk about for the next two slides here is the double diamond framework. Um, I'm not gonna get into what that is or how to use it. Um, I'm, if it's not a framework you're familiar with, look it up. Uh, it's very simple. It essentially is the idea of diverging and converging twice uh, or many times, or, you know, and then iterating many times, I should say, uh, to reach the best solution in the fastest way possible. 
So if you are um, in the first of diverging, um, this is really, you're at the beginning of your project. The, the question for you at this point is what, so forget technology, go hog wild, don't even think like, okay, what is our robot gonna say? What's our chatbot gonna say? Forget you're even doing that and make sure that you're gonna build the right type of solution for the right problem, for that problem. Observe actual current solutions um, to the problem that you are trying to solve if, if anything does exist. Wizard of Oz test within a right, which is a rapid iterative testing and evaluation framework, as low-fi as you possibly can get away with. In this situation, the wizard might literally be a human behind a curve, pretending to be the chat voice, the robot voice. If you're in first diamond converging, so you've come up with a whole bunch of information and ideas, um, and now you want to look at them and sort of figure out what's the good one of these. Um, your question at this point is, what's the structure of that conversation? Talk to engineering um, or your engineer about the feasibility of what you want to build. You might consider doing a second rate study if you have the time and money. Um, and Wizard of Oz testing at this point should replicate the desired channels of delivery, uh, but they can still be medium fidelity. So what I mean by that is if it's going to be a purely spoken um, you know, conversational experience like an Alexa without a screen, um, then you need to replicate that channel of delivery, uh, but it doesn't need to be on an Alexa, meaning duplicate the fact that there's just going to be a conversation and nothing else. The wizard in this case might be a person in another room using a messaging program, if it's a, if it's a texting chatbot, um, or a speakerphone, if it's a spoken UI. Um, if you are in second, second diamond say, stage, so you're a little further down the road at this point in your project planning. If you're in second diamond diverging, it means you've, you've gotten, you've kind of come up with what you think is the right solution, um, and now you want to iterate and make, make it better, and make sure it's the best. Um, so your question to yourself at this point is, what words does this conversation use? Um, you're going to need to abide by your channel's technical constraints. Your Wizard of, and your Wizard of Oz testing can be truer to the actual experience, but the language can vary. So instruct your observers to note relatively large facial or body language reactions, like things like that, big, um, and ask testers about these moments. This can help you understand when the specifics of what your, uh, of your, the language is not quite right. And if you're in second, diamond converging, your question to yourself at this point is, does this conversation work like this with lots of variations of your target population? So you need to abide by your technical and channel constraints for this testing, and your Wizard of Oz testing needs to be as high fidelity as possible, but doesn't thing. So do use the exact same language, uh, tone, and pacing so that you can test these things. I know I'm going, I went through all of that really fast. We're getting really short on time here. But luckily, we're almost at the end. Um, so, I, so to wrap up a little bit here, um, because we we uh, we covered a lot um, very quickly, and some of it at a very high level, and there's so much more digging into the deep, the deeper weeds that we could get. Um, work with me again. Things that we couldn't cover today are tailored advice. So not only can we get into uh, what I talked about today um, in way more specifics, depending on who you are and what your needs are, but the, we're going to tailor that advice right to you. Um, so we can create concrete next steps specific to you needs, um, do an in-depth exploration of what your business priorities are, and work together to explore build your use cases uh, if you're not there yet. Um, and this is all research backed both by academic, clinical, and my own research to find answers to the questions you have today um, which can take a bit of time to research in order to find data-driven answers. Um, basically, there are two things I can work with you. I can consult with you or consult for you. Um, I can teach you, I, I can lead you to the water and teach you how to um, work on employee engagement and how that affects mine, ultimately. Um, employee onboarding and retention, again, 
affects your bottom line, um, and setting and maintaining a, a company or a group culture, uh, which, again, affects your bottom line, um, can also teach you or coach you or a team that you manage on how to create a chatbot and conversation design. Um, or I and uh, folks that I consult with can work for you, get your service or product for the best market fit, um, create low to high fidelity prototypes for generative and formative testing with real folks, and ensure that you're building the right thing the right way, whatever that thing is. Back to you, Samantha. I feel like a news reporter. Uh, so thank you, Stacey. That was amazing. I hope there were a lot of takeaways for everyone. Um, and obviously, she has a lot of information to share. And I think it's also really important to note what she said is that things are very case specific. And your business is case specific. Your product is case specific. And you know, this is a, obviously a complex topic. And so you want to work with Stacey one on one. Uh, basically, if you want to do the best job and you want to create the best product, uh, you can probably save yourself a lot of time and heartache and wasted dollars <laughs> just consulting with Stacy before you even get started. Um, so we're really happy to offer 50% off of your first one-on-one -on -one with Stacy on Common Genius. Now, this is only available to people that are viewing the webinar live right now. So this will not be available for people who access uh, the recording in the future. This is only available just to the people that are on right now. So to be eligible for this 50% off, what you want to do is go to the little tab that says private. You can see it says public, presenters, and then private. And then you scroll down to Lucy Sue, who's under admin, and just you can click on her and then send her a private message with your uh, name, your email, and your phone number. Um, and you can do that anytime before the end of our webinar today. So basically for the next 10 minutes, if you're interested in being eligible for 50% off your first one-on-one -on -one meeting with Stacy on Common Genius, then please PM Lucy now. You could also email her at lucy at commongenius.com um, if that's not clear. So again, you should definitely meet with her. She's incredible. She'll, she's really, really great and clearly has a lot to, 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 um, to share. Uh, <clears throat> so we're going to move on a little bit. Uh, we are going to do a QA. and a I just wanted to give you a brief heads up again on what Common Genius is in case any of you came in late. Common Genius is an, uh, it's an app and a desktop um, uh, website where you can access experts on demand uh, through video chat. So our website, our full website is launching in January, but we do have an iOS avail app available now. So again, that's only for Apple and iPad, but our, our full website will be launching in January. So experts like Stacy, business development experts, people who can help you with your pitch, career coaches, um, life coaches, business experts, they're all across the board. Uh, and they usually have a lot of experience like Stacy does and are pretty seasoned. So that's Common Genius. Uh, if you are on this call and you're interested in applying to be an expert and you have a a similar kind of you know 10 15 20 years of experience you might be eligible to be an expert if you're interested in that um, you can just click on that link and it will repost that link because I know you can't click on the PowerPoint and that will get you uh, early access uh, it is an application so we do vet everybody um, and it is a kind of rigorous application process so without further ado we're going to move on to the Q&A uh, if she doesn't get your question again that is just another reason for you to book a one-on-one -on -one meeting with her so that you can have some FaceTime with her. Uh, and so we're just gonna go over to the Q&A. So if you have a question, um, you can just enter it into the Q&A now. And so let's see what we have here. Okay, so the first question is by Gabriella, and it's, could you give an example for putting, quote, all the good stuff at the end when creating something for interaction vocally? Sure. Um, so I think I gave an example of that during the, uh, actually within the deck, um, which was my my personal elevator pitch, which I showed you sort of the difference between how you'd write it um, and how you might edit it uh, for speaking. Um, but another uh, another example that I might give of um, putting all the good stuff. So a, a really good example is 
if you're trying to explain anything procedural, um, you would normally write it as in step one, do this, step two, then do this, step three, then, then do this. And if you created a conversational experience that was procedural in that way and didn't create the uh, technical ability for the person having that experience to say, okay, stop between steps or I'm ready, move on. On you, you. What happens is, is you you've read them all four steps, and they only remember step four. And you have to. Could you repeat that again? Step one, do blah blah blah. Step two, do. Blah. And so each time they have to now focus on step one. Okay, now repeat it again so that I can focus. Um, that's that's sort of really a, the, a good example of how to think differently about that kind of content. Great, and so Gabrielle also says, sorry, you did answer that. And clearly uh, she was paying better attention than I was because I didn't realize that. <laughs> so Gabriella has another question. Any books you would recommend on designing and deploying innovative products or solutions? So any books you would recommend on designing and deploying innovative products or solutions? I, I would say that if you haven't yet read Steve Krug's Don't Make Me Think, that is the best place to start. Um, it's it's a very easy read. It's written, it itself is written very conversationally, um, and and it, it's written it's it's just all about a uh, thousand and four different things. I'm exaggerating slightly um, of things to think about in order to reduce cognitive overload is a, the fifty cent term for that. Um, but how to how to how to keep folks from thinking too much because that's sort of the name of the game. Uh, you start making them think too much, they they back away, they don't want to, they don't even realize that's what it, the problem is. Um, there's lots of other good books out there, but that's where to begin. Great. I so see I'll Mo that, suggesting you. Yeah, so I will put that in the chat, and then Mo is also suggesting 10 Faces of Innovation. Have you read that one, Stacey? I haven't. Thank you, Mo, for the suggestion. Thank you, Mo. Uh, so our next question is from Ife, uh, text bot versus voice bot. Which one is better for which use case? Mm -hmm. Text bot versus voice bot, which one is better for which use case? So if, if you're trying to drive behavioral change, for, and again, the ethics behind that I'm not here to discuss, for whatever reason, um, it really you really will want to create something that has a face. And you can do that with a chat bot by creating a character who, who that you talk to. Um, but if you, and that, that might create a relationship of sorts, but you won't, it's people won't build trust. We're not yet, at least, and this is maybe will not be true in the same way in 50 years years when humans' expectations and lives have changed dramatically. But right now, humans aren't really capable of building real trust with something that doesn't have, have eyeballs. It's eyeballs. Um, and there's definitely research out there that supports this. So if you're looking to, to drive behavioral change, you're going to need to build trust. And therefore, you will need uh, something that has eyeballs that you can talk to and look at like a human. Um, if you're really looking to answer questions um, that either your customers are getting, uh, I'm sorry, your, your customer support team is getting from customers or your own employees are asking each other a lot, um, chatbot, you, you're, that's not a situation where you're looking to drive behavioral change. Um, and so a text-based chatbot might be a perfectly fine solution. And the reason I say perfectly fine is if you are going to go the route of building a robot, please know if you've never done hardware, that uh, hardware and software are hard. <laughs> They're a lot harder than just software. Great, thank you, Stacy. Um, so I think that's all the questions we have now, um, which is great because we're out of time, so perfect. <laughs> um, so want to want to thank Stacy. I also want to encourage you to check out her blog if you haven't yet, which also goes over some of this. And I'm just going to stick that right in the uh, right in the chat as well. So her blog goes over some of the stuff we talked about, um, and uh, is 
just a really good and informative blog. Uh, so uh, I just want to thank Stacy, and I also want to tell you about our upcoming webinars. So we have a webinar January 24th, Teamwork Across Cultures with Lanya Aloy, uh, Getting Video Advertising Right with Vesna Planko on January 30th, and Leading with Love by uh, John Montgomery on February 14th. So we encourage you to come to all of those. The registration is not live for uh, those webinars yet, but you will be getting an invitation to those webinars. So without further ado, I just want to give Stacy a, a round of applause on behalf of everybody, since I know you all can't applaud, so I'm going to applaud. Uh, and this webinar recording is going to be sent to you. It will be a YouTube link. And your, uh, you will also get a copy of the slides. So uh, without further ado, um, I will let Stacy hop off. And I'm going to also let you know you have, I'm going to stay on for about two minutes. If you have any questions for me about Common Genius, I'm happy to answer them. And also, uh, if you still want to be, to be eligible for the 50% offer, again, you want to either email Lucy at commongenius.com or you want to go over to private and then PM uh, Lucy with your name, your email, and your phone number, and then we will follow up uh, with your exclusive discount code to get a 50% off meeting with Stacey. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.